from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. Welcome now our very special guest. He's Richard Clarida, Federal Reserve Vice Chairman, for an exclusive interview. So welcome, Mr. Cha Vice Chairman. Good to have you here. Great to be here, David. We've had a decision on the Fed in the last week, uh, and we had a news conference with the uh, chair, Jay Powell. Uh, the markets took away what they wanted to. What should we have taken away from it? Well, you know, we've said the U.S. economy is in a good place, uh, solid growth, uh, historically low unemployment, uh, inflation uh, stable, and we left rates unchanged, but that was the right call. We think the policy in place is appropriate to support a continuation. Again, solid growth, uh, strong labor market, and low uh, inflation. So I think that's the, that's the message. Yeah, low inflation is a good thing up to a point. Yeah. I mean, you've done scholarly work in this area. Exactly. But we also heard the chairman this week say, you know what, I don't want to take any risk on disinflation. He was really quite adamant at the 2 percent. What can you do to make sure we're at or above 2 percent? You know, that's a good point. And we did clarify in our statement at this meeting, David, that we have a policy in place that we think will get inflation back up to 2 percent. And as the chair indicated, the reason why you want to keep inflation at the goal and not let it drift down is we've seen in Europe and Japan, if you let that happen, and then over a decade, it really gets more difficult to keep the economy humming. And so we're just talking about a policy that's going to move inflation up just a bit to 2 percent, which we think is important. But how are you going to get that done? Because thus far, you haven't been able to get core inflation up to 2 percent, yeah. despite a very accommodative policy. In fact, financial conditions right now are at record levels of, yes. of, of being accommodating, and it hasn't gotten the core inflation back up. Well, you know, last year in 2018, briefly, core inflation did get to 2 percent, and we're not that far away now. And we did, as you know, and your viewers know, we provided some accommodation in 2019 with a total of three rate cuts. And we think with those rate cuts in place, it takes time for them to work through the economy. We do think and we do project that we will get back up to 2 percent. It seems to some that uh, it's easier to get infl uh, uh, asset values up than it is to get growth up. Yeah. A assets clearly are at high levels right now. If you look around the markets, they, we have a yeah. little trouble right now maybe with the virus, but they're really up. But growth is a little trickier. We saw the numbers come on on GDP. It's 2.1 percent or so. Yeah. Well, exactly. And really our focus, our mandate from Congress is maximum employment and price stability. Uh, so our job is not to move up and down with asset prices. Asset prices are important. Obviously, they impact wealth uh, and they're a factor into our outlook, but we're not targeting asset uh, prices. And again, growth right now is is more or less in line with the growth in the labor force and, and productivity. And so that's that's not a bad place uh, to be, but we want to sustain that. Are we at full employment? And obviously, it's been a very robust employment yeah. situation for some time now. At the same time, the labor partici participation rate is not up above where it was before. Yeah. That is a great question. I'm glad you gave me the opportunity <laughs> to answer it because the Powell Fed has been very open-minded about understanding that there are a lot of benefits to a low unemployment rate. Um, and unless and until we see those low unemployment rates putting excessive upward pressure on inflation, uh, we're not prepared to say we're necessarily at full employment. Economists, there are a lot of things economists don't know, and one thing they don't know for sure is what is full employment. And we're willing to probe to see how low the unemployment rate uh, uh, can go. There are a lot of benefits to that, as our Fed Listens events have uh, confirmed. We're talking with Richard Clary. Yeah. He's vice chair of the Federal Reserve. If you compare uh, labor participation rates in the United States with other other countries, such as Japan, for example, yeah. so we're substantially below that level. Are there systemic reasons for that? Well, that's a subject that labor economists have studied. There has been a welcome development, David, in the past three or four years. Labor participation among prime age uh, individuals is picking up. It's now about where it was, especially uh, in around 06 and 07. But you are correct. We're still below even in prime age participation where we were 20 years ago. So there's still some upside. But your international uh, observation is a correct one. And historically, the U.S. participation rates tended to be equal or higher than those in Europe, but they have been sagging. I'm not quite sure of why, but recent developments have, good and have been good, and we're trying to promote that. One of the things that came up, certainly in the news conference, was the coronavirus, which yes. is now in China. It's in everyone's mind around the world, I yeah. think, right now. Yeah. Certainly markets are paying attention. And what we heard is that you're very carefully monitoring that. Obviously, none of us knows. Certainly, I don't know where this is going, yeah. how long it will last, how bad right. it will get. But when you say you're closely monitoring, what are you monitoring? What do you well, how can you tell if it's really getting you a problem for the economy? Well, you know, that's a great question. We do not have a crystal ball. First of all, we want to acknowledge, and I acknowledge you know, the suffering and, and, and really tragedy for those afflicted with this. Um, it is a wild card. I think uh, even the experts would 
confirm that it's too soon to tell. And we're looking at how it translates into the outlook for Chinese growth, for global growth, and how it impacts the U.S. But again, monitoring closely, but, it, but it's too soon to tell what the ultimate impact will if be. If you look at growth as GDP, for example, yeah. often that's backward looking. It's too late. Yeah. By the time that happens, yeah. you, you had to have acted earlier yeah. than that. What about early indicators, such as, for example, yield curve? For example, we have three-month, 10-year right now inverted again. Yeah. That has a lot of people a little nervous. Well, and that, and that move, David, really has been a pretty recent move. Indeed, at the time of our December meeting, the yield curve was far from an inverted. So my own individual interpretation of it is that that is really dr driven not so much by an outlook for the U.S. economy, but globally, when there's uncertainty, money flows into the U.S. that tends to lower yields, and I think that's what's going on there now. So I'm not, I'm not today concerned about the inverted uh, yield curve because I think it's not really reflecting the U.S. outlook. So how do you try to avoid the risk of being too late in taking an action? Because well, whatever the coronavirus means, sure. it can't be good. Right. It's not good for Chinese growth and probably not good for worldwide growth. Right, right. We just don't know how bad it is. Right. So how do you make sure you're not too early, but you're not too late? Well, of course, that's, that's, the, that's the art of monetary policy. Uh, in fact, in 2019, we did make some moves to provide a downward adjustment to policy precisely to take out insurance and to try to get ahead of the, of the curve. And so the Powell Fed has indicated that it can act in anticipation to offset shocks. But again, it's too soon to tell. We'll take it meeting uh, by meeting. You know, if this were to result in, say, a one or qu two quarter slowdown in growth, that's probably not something that changes the big picture. Uh, but I agree, it's a challenging situation. We're going to keep on top of it. You have spent much of your career as an esteemed academic. Well, as an uh, academic, real, anyway. No, yeah. Esteemed <laughs> academic. <laughs> now you. you're inside yeah. where, where the decision making gets done. It's very important that our Fed be independent of the political process. Yes. At the same time, the decisions you make down in Washington for the Fed have real ramifications in the real world for yes. people, for their jobs, for their incomes, for what happens. You bet. And we see it reflected. How do you take into account the, the likely effect in the real world of what you're doing without becoming part of the political process? Well, let me, that's a great question. Let me, let me remind folks that um, we essentially have one instrument of monetary policy, which is we can raise or lower interest rates. Um, and so we recognize that it's a big economy, 300 plus million people, 50 states. So we're not going to be running individual monetary policies. But what we also know, David, is that when unemployment is low, when the economy is growing at a healthy pace, and when prices are stable, that tends to benefit a lot of people, not just those at the top. But we've done these Fed Listens events this year, 14 around the country, where Literally, we're doing most of the listening, and we're, we cast a wide net. We're not just talking to bankers and academics, but folks from labor markets and community groups. And what we hear consistently in those is that when the economy is healthy, when the labor market is booming, it does, it does lift many, many boats. And getting a first job or getting a raise is very important. So we factor that in. We're honest enough to know that we can't set individual policy state by state. But we do think there are real gains to keeping the economy in a, in a good place. As you perform Form this Fed listens campaign. Yeah. Do you find substantial variations based on regions, based on geography? Uh, is the situation much better in the economy, for example, you know, on the West Coast than it is in the Upper Midwest? The interesting thing, David, about the Fed listens is, and I did a number of them, not all 14, but many of them, uh, is there really was not all that much geographic difference. Hmm. Um, uh, obviously, some parts of the economy are doing better than others, but consistently we heard, as I mentioned, the gains to maintaining a strong uh, labor market and also the gains to staying away from the bad old days of high and volatile inflation. Uh, one of the things that is being talked about much right now is whether you have enough tools in your toolkit yeah. if there's a real downturn. We yeah. don't have one yet, but if it came, yeah. it will come sooner or later, I think it's yeah. fair to say. Do you have enough tools in your toolkit? And we talk about monetary versus fiscal policy. Yeah. We had Christine Lagarde, uh, the new president of the oh, ECB, yeah. just last week say that really we need to be doing more talking across that divide of fiscal monetary. This is part of what she said. The risks caused by climate change on corporates, on the economy, on general stability have been largely underestimated. The climate risks in 30 years that need action now if we want to remedy those risks, that's difficult. But we need, we need to do it. That's Madam Lagarde on a somewhat different point, but terribly important, and that is climate change. Because yeah. we increasingly hear the central banks have to take that into account, in part because it really could be disrupt the financial markets. 
Yes. Well, as Chair Powell indicated in the press conference on Wednesday, we are participating in this network for the greening of the financial uh, system. You know, obviously in the U.S. and in other countries, climate change policy is really the domain of the legislature and the executive branch. And so we don't do climate change policy at the Fed. But the American people have a right to expect that as part of our supervision and oversight of the financial system, we want to make sure that financial institutions uh, are are appropriately prepared and have business models that are uh, you know, robust to any climate change uh, issues. One of the things that's being suggested is, for example, in Europe to try to really stimulate growth, because growth, once again this morning, it turns out, yeah. was not what we would like it to be, no. is investment in green. Yeah. There's talk about investment there. When it comes to fiscal policy, should we have more communication between monetary and fiscal. Yeah. Now, that's not interfering with no, independence, understood. but just why don't you sit down and say, what should we do, do monetarily, what should we do fiscally? Well, l l first of all, uh, there is communication historically and at present, certainly between the Treasury Secretary um, and uh, the Federal Reserve uh, Chairman and also the undersecretaries and the vice chair. So we have, we have constant communication, but the reality is, is that the Fed, I think, appropriately has always understood that fiscal policy is the domain of the Congress and the President. We understand it. We use fiscal policy as an input uh, into our monetary policy. And also, I would assume that fiscal policymakers are understanding our monetary policy as well. I think it works well uh, in the U.S. to have this separation of responsibility. But we obviously are communicating and will continue to do so. As an economist, yeah. uh, do you, what's your assessment of the risk that by using monetary policy the way we have, for good and sufficient reason, yeah. we actually have increased wealth and income inequality because the money has tended to stay at the top with people who have capital. Yeah. It's a mass capital through increased asset values and has not really, forgive the expression, trickled down. Okay, well, obviously, uh, the rise in income uh, inequality is an important issue. Those trends have really been ongoing now uh, for decades. Experts are divided on the relative causes. My own individual rule view is that the primary sources of income equality are, are educational, technological, mm -hmm. globalization. Uh, what I can say about income inequality is that for many people, having a job and getting a raise is the best thing for them to reduce income inequality, and, and that's really our focus at the Fed. Well, in fact, real wages are increasing yes. now in the United States, and yeah. maybe disproportionately for people at the lower that's end what the of the data spectrum. Shows, yeah. As an economist, how much of that is because of policies made in Washington? How much of it is because of increased minimum wage at state levels, because several states have increased the minimum yes. wage. Indeed, and I've, I've looked at evidence uh, on that, and there is some, obviously some contribution of higher state minimum wages to the rise in, in wages for lower income workers, but it's certainly not all of it. Really, the healthy labor market, the low unemployment rate is, is, is the dominant factor, I think. So the message I think most of us are taking out of the Fed right now is yeah. things are going pretty well, as yeah. you said, the economy's in pretty good shape. We in don't a good see, place. A yeah. good place, exactly right. And, and therefore, there's not a need to change monetary policy without a material change. That's what we've said. Yes. Okay, give me a sense. What's material change? Is that in the amount of a change? Is it the duration of the change? How do we know it's material? What's the difference between material well, we, and immaterial? What, what we said, David, it's a material change in the outlook because monetary policy operates with a lag. So we have to make a decision based on where we see the economy going. So it's really a material change in the outlook. There's no one indicator. There's no one magic number that would that would trigger that. But we have a very capable professional staff, um, and uh, the material change would be something that would, you know, materially change our outlook for uh, our dual mandate objectives, which is uh, inflation and unemployment. Given where the economy has been in recent months and years, yeah. is that really to oversimplify coming yeah. out of the U.S. consumer? Well, the U.S. US consumer is 70 percent of economic activity goes to consumption. And the, as I've said uh, before, I'll say again, in my professional career, which dates back for three decades and more, the U.S. consumer has never been in better shape. If you look at employment, if you look at uh, de the de deleveraging that the household sector did after the crisis, paying down debt, savings rate is high. So the, Thank goodness the U.S. consumer is in great shape because it's a key part of the economy. Indeed. Okay. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you, David. That's Fed Vice Chairman Richard Clarida joining us today for an exclusive interview. Coming up, we'll check the markets and how they're reacting to the coronavirus. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Abigail Doolittle for a check on the markets, and the markets are moving, not necessarily in a good way. Yeah, we're really looking at a sell-off at this point, and it appears or it feels like we may be at a tipping point around this coronavirus. And I say that we're going from the headline risk fear that can cause big whipsaws in the markets to the possibility or the likely certainty, even based on your conversation there with Richard Clarida, uh, and certainly based on what Goldman Sachs is saying about U.S. GDP, that it's going to affect the global global economic growth. We even have had a few airlines today, uh, today today saying that they're not going to be flying to China for a couple of months. Uh, those are rather specific numbers. So there are probably doctors helping them trying to figure out the incubation period. But it will affect, we're always talking about stocks at the end of the day, no matter what the news is, trade off of the corporate profit outlook. For American Airlines and Delta, if they are shutting down service to the world's largest, second largest economy in the world for a couple of months, that will affect the bottom line. Yeah, it seems like we don't know how bad it is, how long it'll go, but it's not getting better. It's getting worse exactly. day by day. Exactly. Right now, it seems as though it's only multiplying, still uncertainty around the uh, incubation. Where is it in the United States to the degree that it is beyond the cases that have been reported? If that's the case, it may not be the case, but that level of uncertainty it's showing in the VIX. It's also showing uh, for the emerging market index on pace for its worst week uh, in two years. So investors really taking chips off the table. The other factor here, last year's big rally, uh, price to perfection, not pricing in this sort of an event and one as you're talking about. We just don't know the facts. It, it could take weeks before we have a good sense for what this will mean. Taking chips off the table when it comes to equities, not so much bonds. Not That's so much bonds. That's where they're putting the chips down right now. You're right about that. We have a big bond rally, the best since August. So investors taking uh, money out of the growth year risk assets, putting them into the havens, uh, hoping for sunnier days, but for right now, uh, having that hedge in place. Okay, Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much for that update on the markets. And now we turn to Mark Crumpton. He's here with Bloomberg First Word News. David, China calls the U.S. government's response to the coronavirus outbreak unhelpful. Beijing promises it will bring the disease under control. The U.S. has advised citizens to avoid traveling to China. And if they're already there, the government says they should come home. A top Senate Democrat says his party is, quote, resigned to the Republican-led Senate acquitting President Trump without calling any additional witnesses. Dick Durbin of Illinois said he doesn't think Chief Justice John Roberts would weigh in to break a tie on the vote to call witnesses in the impeachment trial. Democrats have been hopeful that enough Republicans would vote in favor of seeking new evidence. But Tennessee Senator Lamar Alexander says he will oppose that motion. Britain began the day as a member of the European Union, but by the end of the day, it will have officially left the EU. The departure comes three and a half years after the country voted by a margin of 52 percent to 48 percent to walk away. It's the first time a country has left the European Union. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is calling Brexit, quote, not an end, but a beginning. Iran's nuclear energy group is calling recent sanctions by the United States unwise. But the Atomic Energy Organization says the measures won't interrupt what it calls Iran's, quote, peaceful nuclear activities. The new sanctions come amid heightened tensions between Tehran and Washington since the Trump administration withdrew America from the 2015 nuclear deal between Iran and world powers in 2018. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. We have a programming note now. This Monday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to have live coverage of the Iowa caucus, live from New Des Moines, Iowa, that will be. I'll be out there with our full Bloomberg political team. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. By this time tomorrow, the Trump impeachment trial could be in the history books, or then again, maybe not. We're hearing conflicting reports that maybe the impeachment trial will go into next week, or some people think they might get a vote late tonight. And that depends, of course, in part on whether the Senate accepts or rejects the request for witnesses to be called. Joining us with more is June Grasso, the host of Bloomberg Law, airing weeknights on Bloomberg Radio and Saturday as well. Yes. Okay, June, welcome. So the thing that really struck me, and maybe you 
as well as Chief Justice Roberts, uh, had a dramatic role, actually, in the trial. He did. Yesterday, and up until this point, he's been just sort of the referee rather than a judge. He intervened when he thought things were getting a little too heated with rhetoric. But yesterday, he was presented with a question from Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky that would have required him to say the name of the whistleblower out, li mm. out loud, and he refused or declined to do that. And he's also refused to present questions where the senators have asked that specific House managers or defense team members answer the questions. He's decided that no, whichever, this, whichever side wants to answer will answer. So he's tried to keep this level of decorum with that one exception. And one of the things that struck me, June, is that uh, he's basically gotten bipartisan support for this, for not answering the question. They also had the Elizabeth Warren question about it doesn't embarrass the chief justice. Justice, and he got the support from Adam Schiff. It seems like both sides are sort of supporting him. Yes, no one wants to get on the bad side of the <laughs> chief justice in any respect. And he's really comported himself well here. He's done everything he can to sort of minimize his role. He's followed the lead of Chief Justice William Rehnquist, mm -hmm. his mentor, who never had to break any ties. So the question becomes, if he does have to break a tie, will he? Well, what about that? I mean, See, it's not out is... of the realm of possibility we'd have a 50-50 vote on calling witnesses. What does exactly. he do? Well, you know, you and I both know that this is a, something that the chief does not want to do. No. He doesn't want to intervene in a political trial and come out with a political answer for one side or the other. Now, Chief Justice Chase in the trial of Andrew Johnson <laughs> broke two ties. But I've been looking into this and scholars are split on whether or not the chief justice has to break a tie and I found that the Congressional Research Service said that the chief justice when presiding over an impeachment trial would not be expected to vote even in the case of a tie if a vote on the question results in a tie the question is decided in the negative oh. so I suspect that if that is presented to the chief that he will go, and he's been following the rules of the parliamentarian. A lot of what he's done, you see him whispering to the woman in front. Yeah. And so I think that he'll take that as an out. I can't imagine that a chief who has said that, you know, justices should just call balls and strikes is one is going to want to call this one on either side. No, exactly. That's great research, by the way. Thank well you. done. <laughs> I'm, I'm really impressed. Going back to the law library here. Okay, quickly, unfairly, are we going to see a vote before Monday? You know, this, I mean, what, what, is, what is stunning about this is that we keep on going back and forth. Yeah. You know, after a, a week ago, I thought there were going to be witnesses. After t after two weeks of arguments and and uh, questions, mm -hmm. we're back to where we were when Nancy Pelosi delayed yeah. sending the articles of impeachment. Yeah. So. I don't know. I think that the Democrats are going to try to pull some yeah. procedural things yeah. to delay the vote. I think which, they want the... Uh, which could put more pre pressure on the Chief Justice, actually. You know? Actually, it could. It might stay. Okay. It remains Thanks. interesting. Thanks so much to June Grasso of Bloomberg Radio. She is the host of Bloomberg Law, airing weekdays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time and on Saturdays at 7 and at 5. Now, a program we know, we're going to have live coverage of the State of the Union Justice coming up Tuesday. We're going to be on at 9 o'clock in the evening. This is Bloomberg. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Trump's impeachment trial enters what may be its last day or maybe not. And it doesn't look like right now the Pre Democrats have gotten the votes that they need to call witnesses. Joining me now from Capitol Hill is Kevin Cirilli, Bloomberg's chief Washington correspondent. So I thought, Kevin, that if they're going to vote yeah. down the motion to call witnesses, it would be pretty much over. But now we're hearing maybe not so much. All right, I just spoke to a senior source, a senior aide, rather, to a Republican senator to walk me through this process. And here's what we know, that in about five hours after the senators gavel in, in, in the next half hour or so, that is when we anticipate the vote on witnesses. Now, the, the Democrats were not able to secure enough votes for there to be witnesses. So anticipate that vote between 5 and 7 p.m. New York time this evening. But from there, then it gets into closing arguments. And this is, the pro this is the part where we don't know whether or not Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and other lawmakers will want to barrel through this, in which case an acquittal could come in the early morning hours of Saturday. 
or if they would like to take longer on the closing arguments and longer on these types of public speeches, and that could put us into Monday or Tuesday. That has ramifications for scheduling, not only for the president, who is set to deliver his State of the Union address on Tuesday evening, New York time, but also for those Democratic presidential candidates like Amy Klobuchar, Elizabeth Warren, and Bernie Sanders. Yeah, it really gives them a tough time. <laughs> but just take me through this a minute. If they don't get a vote sometime tonight or overnight into the early morning hours, don't they sit again on Saturday? Couldn't they get it done on Saturday? Why does it take us into Monday or Tuesday? Well, precisely, and this is where now uh, the the all important being able to control the clock. It's almost you know it's like it's honestly like in in football. I mean, whoever has the ball, and in this case, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, they have control of the clock. So whether or not they want that final vote tomorrow. Whether or not they want that final vote on Monday, the day of the Iowa caucus, that's where all of this gets interesting. Or it could be a long night early morning here on Capitol Hill. But I'll bring you the latest as I get it. And just a, just a final note, there will be a vote at 5 on witnesses, likely between 5 and 7 New York time on witnesses, and that will tee up the acquittal process. Because it's at least a step in the right direction, I guess, yes. towards some sort yes. of resolution. Yes. Of this. Thank you so much, Kevin. We'll be checking back in yes. with you to Thank get you. the latest as it develops. As Kevin Cirilli, our chief Washington correspondent on Capitol Hill. Well, impeachment has necessarily occupied all the Congress time and attention in the new year to take us through what comes next. Welcome now, Libby Cantrell. She is PIMCO, head of public policy. So I guess I have to ask you, because you know those people so much, what are they doing? I mean, <laughs> what was the point of this? I mean, there, there's no question in anybody's mind that he's not going to be convicted, he's going to be acquitted. So why don't we just get Well, I do with? think, I mean, I think there was more questions about allowing for witnesses, and yeah. I think it's a little bit surprising, especially in Senate races that are quite vulnerable for key Republicans like Cory Gardner from Colorado or Senator McSally from Arizona. It, it will be interesting to see whether this vote comes to haunt them um, by precluding mm. additional witnesses because of course the voting uh, among the electorate really does or the polling excuse me really does support uh, allowing additional witnesses. So it'll be interesting in those sort of key Senate races whether it makes any sort of difference but of course it doesn't make a difference for the president's approval rating. His approval rating has been has been Teflon so whether this is finished you know, tomorrow morning or on Monday, uh, it's not likely to have any big impact. There is some other business, or at least potential business, in the Congress still, despite the election year. I yeah. mean, we hear about things like drug prices. We hear That's about right. things even like a highway bill, maybe infrastructure with that. Where does that sit, and does this process uh, affect that in any way? Has it sort of contaminated some of the water up there and make it harder for them to get together and do something? Yeah, it's interesting because I think counter to the narrative and the, the sort of the financial press that Congress hasn't done anything, um, of course, they did ratify the USMCA. They also passed the SECURE Act, a major piece of retirement legislation. Um, they did pass a bipartisan criminal justice reform bill, you know, almost uh, you know, a year and a half ago. So the Congress is doing something, um, maybe not to the effect that, that the American electorate would want. Um, but I do think that we need to think about Congress and sort of their actions as really trying to do no harm in an election year, um, maybe get some, you know, put some points on the board, but probably from a policy perspective or from a markets perspective, perspective not do very much and that's I think an important point David because you will see infrastructure making headlines you will see Trump tax cuts 2.0 and we at PIMCO don't expect any additional fiscal stimulus to support uh -huh. the economy going into the election i.e. Congress will not move on any of those things but it's of course a convenient talking point going into the going into the election. But what about drug prices? That's the not fiscal pricing, stimulus. No, no no that isn't and, and obviously um, you know the president has sort of he's supported it but he's equivocated on how exactly mm. to go about doing that um, certainly uh, Speaker Pelosi has her own legislation. We'll see. I, you know, we'll see what Senator Majority McConnell really wants to get done. And this is where impeachment may have sort of poisoned the well, the well, uh, so to speak. That um, sort of the ability or the comedy among mm -hmm. the chambers mm -hmm. is probably at an all-time, all-time level. But you're not absolutely ruling it out. That's one thing that no, you think there's no, a chance. No, no, I think it's again. Yeah, I think, chance. and I think that it's from an investor's perspective, especially obviously for the healthcare sector right. and pharmaceutical sector, it's something worth monitoring. Okay, interesting. And so, what, what's President Trump's strategy with the Hill at this point? Just to have it do nothing? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, at this point, you know, he's passed. He's been able to get his USMCA, his signature uh, legislative achievement uh, passed this this year. So and he effectively got money for his wall too. He got money for his wall, and he also yeah, right. And he did get you know he got a nice sort of government spending boost going into an right. election year as well. So I think from his perspective, yeah. you know, he can sort of rail on them as a do nothing Congress, right. which will yeah. hold him in good stead, and um, while also saying that he did achieve some things. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, Libby Cantrell, Pimco head of public policy, is going to be staying with us. We're going to get her thoughts.
thoughts on the 2020 election coming up next. And a programming note, tune in next Tuesday for our special live coverage of the State of the Union Address and the Democratic Response. That starts at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We have some breaking news right now. According to the New York Daily News, we've identified the first case of coronavirus in New York. It's in Queens, actually. This, again, according to the New York Daily News, the first coronavirus case has been confirmed in Queens, New York. We will bring you more information on that as it develops. That's all we know right at the moment. In the meantime, we're only three days away from the Iowa caucuses. Candidates are in the midst of their last-minute swings through the state, at least the candidates not stuck in the Senate and eager to get out of there. For an update, we welcome now our political reporter on the scene in Des Moines. She's Ms. Elena Enkofapolo. Well, Ms. Elena, welcome. Good to have you here. Tell us what's going on in Iowa right now. So, David, thank you for having me. Notably absent from the state in this past week have been the senators that have been stuck in D.C. for impeachment proceedings, and that's Senator, um, Senator Sanders, Sen Senator Amy Klobuchar, and Senator Elizabeth Warren. And they're expected to return to the state this weekend with multiple events scheduled to really try and get their message out in the last few days of Iowa, uh, uh, of, Iowa um, of, I of, I of the Iowa race to sort of make their pitches about why they're the candidates to beat Donald Trump and why they're the candidates to unite the Democratic Party. And what we're seeing is they're taking the, the state by storm. Senator Sanders has events with, um, with all of his surrogates. He has a concert with Vampire Weekend. Um, Senator Warren is going across the state um, from river to river and sort of talking to voters, and so is Amy Klobuchar. But what's happening is there's a lot of undecided voters, and a lot of their competitors, like Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg, have been in the state talking to these voters as the, as the rest of the senators have been stuck in D.C. And so this is really their last chance to get their message out and really convince those other undecided voters to stand in their corner on Monday during caucus night. Mr. Lane, do you have any sense of the extent to which an endorsement can make up for some of the lack of face time of some of those poor three senators who are stuck in the Senate? I mean, I saw you just coming across the Bloomberg a little bit ago. We have Senator Warren picking up, I guess, a couple of important uh, endorsements from local officials out there. Yeah, endorsements can really make a difference. But what's, I think, very notable about all the candidates is that they really have different strengths in the state. And so someone like Elizabeth Warren has, has endorsements. A lot of the candidates do. But her strength, I think, comes from the fact that she has one of the strongest organizing games in the state. Joe Biden is someone who, you know, the state is really familiar with. He's been around. He's Obama's VP. And so people really know him. Senator Sanders is really betting on getting voters out and sort of, you know, activating them for the first time and really energizing them to stand in their corner. And Pete Buttigieg has a strength in being that unity candidate that really can appeal to the sort of Obama Trump voters. And so they have their different strengths. A lot of them have endorsements. And what the polls are showing is that there's really no clear front runner. And so this weekend really is their last chance to sort of make their pitches and really get those um, those voters yeah. on their side. Yeah, three days to go. Okay, many thanks now to Bloomberg's Ms. Elena Agkopapalu. Really great to have you with us, Ms. Elena. For more on the state of play in Iowa, we're back now with Libby Cantrell of PIMCO. So, Libby, going back a few months, there was concern in the markets about Elizabeth Warren. We saw, particularly in some sectors, really, is there equal concern about Bernie Sanders? Because Elizabeth Warren, to some extent, has faded in a lot of the polls, and, and yes. Bernie Sanders seems to be coming on really, really strong. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think um, the betting markets actually have Bernie Sanders now above in terms of winning the nomination, in terms of, of odds. Um, although I would just say and sort of reiterate this, and this is what we've been ta talking to clients and our investment committee about, that is it's it's still incredibly early mm -hmm. days. And I think, you know, to the point of the reporter, it is really very much an open field as well. I mean, this the polling indicates that you have the highest share of undecided caucus goers in sort of, you know, the, the, the last decade um, in terms of people going in and, and, and sort of not knowing who exactly they're going to support. So I think this is absolutely an open field. Also important to remember is that Iowa only represents 1% of the delegates, yes, yes. right? So this is a race. So this is all about math. It's about getting 50% of the delegates. Iowa's just very piddly in that. Although I did read today, the last time a Democratic candidate for president uh, did not win Iowa and went on to win was 1992. Right, with Bill Clinton. So, exactly right. Yeah. It's been a long time. So the, the Democratic candidate tends to win. That's Iowa right. So the last, win. right. So every, uh, uh, every Democratic nominee of this century right. has also been the winner of, of Iowa. 
But, and I think another thing that's important to remember, is that this Democratic primary calendar is quite different from previous election yes. cycles. California and Texas, huge you know, delegate uh, states, are much earlier. So while momentum, of course, in Iowa and New Hampshire is important, we could really see the race scrambled as, you know, as early as March 3rd, which is the Super Tuesday with California and Texas. And Libby, you make such a powerful point that it's wide open at this point, and maybe we'll be wide open for longer than we've seen in the past. That's, that's that causes some people to look back at 2000. 16 on the Dem on the Republican side right. and say look what happened there you had so many candidates that lasted so long it makes it less predictable it certainly is less like the the establishment candidate will make it through yeah I think well uh, look I think that that we are telling our our clients just to get you know prepared for a longer primary race right. um, the the rules around super delegates have changed so you're right that sort of the Democratic establishment has less ability to put their thumb on the scale but David and we've talked about this before if it continues to be a crowded race with a bunch of candidates sort of limping along, that could mean that no one candidate gets that 50% threshold of delegates. That could force a broker convention in July. Now, <laughs> I'm not saying that's the base case, but I do think about that I know we so have every cycle, but I do yeah. actually think because of the calendar, because of the super delegates, that's a higher chance this election cycle than, the, than it has been. I don't remember the last time it was in the 40s, well, it was wasn't no, it? 1952. Wasn't it? Oh, 52 was that <laughs> yeah. brokered? Was yes, that right? exactly. So that's, that's, a said. that's a long it time ago. It was a long time ago. Are yes. your clients Granted. really fascinated with this or not because the markets really have not been reacting much to the politics yeah and I think you know now look I think of Bernie Sanders to your earlier question if he wins Iowa and New Hampshire I think we could probably see a little bit of sell-off but I know whether that's justified or not we'll, we'll see um our clients, you know, from my perspective, it's the first question that we've, they've, they've been asking us. They've been, they, you know, they, they want to know our views. They want to know how we're thinking about it. And I think our advice to them is it's early days. Take a deep breath. And the winner of Iowa and New Hampshire is not necessarily going to be the nominee. Well, and whoever's the nominee, they have to beat Donald Trump. They have to and beat Donald right now, Trump, according exactly. to traditional measurements, you would think that this incumbent president would be pretty strong, pretty tough to beat, no matter who the candidate is. Yeah, absolutely. From an economic perspective, from his ability to build an infrastructure, I mean, digitally, he's doing very well. So he's going to be a formidable candidate. I think the, the big limitation for him, of course, is he hasn't really expanded that base, right? His base loves him, but he doesn't have a lot of crossover voters. And that may come to haunt him, especially if the Democrats nominate somebody who is more sort of center left, more centrist. Uh, it's been a on the Congress. We also are going to elect yes. all of the House of Representatives and a third of the Senate. Yes. Uh, what's likely to happen there? Yeah, again, I think when we're talking to our clients, this is also a really important point because especially if some progressive left nominee you know, ends up making their way to the White House, um, the market reaction may be severe, but that may not be the right reaction for the reason is that to get that very progressive left agenda through, you need Congress. And Congress, by definition, even if you have Democrats in the House and you know, Democrats controlling the House and the Senate, there are a lot of moderate Democrats still. You may not hear from them, but they are from purple states. And so those those Democrats are not going to just uh, vote kind of lockstep for a very progressive agenda. So just, you know, watch yeah. the composition of the Congress. Could this, could that, this actually could be more important than who's in the White House. Fascinating. Okay, Libby, it's always so great to have you Thanks here. Thanks so much. That's Libby Cantrell. She's PIMCO head of public policy. We're bringing you special coverage of the Iowa caucus starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Time Monday from Des Moines. And still ahead, we are keeping eyes on the markets. The S&P has erased its gains of, of the year as coronavirus fears grow. Meanwhile, that daily New York Daily News report has now been corrected. New York Daily News now says that there is no coronavirus case, at least confirmed in Queens as of now. Why it's so important to always attribute sources. New York Daily News says they haven't confirmed that coronavirus. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Tesla shares have more than tripled in the last six months. One money manager who saw this coming is Kathy Wood, the CEO of ARK Investment. She joined us on this week's edition of Wall Street Week. The numbers have gone up dramatically, and yet, and yet, uh, we think it's incredibly undervalued. Uh, and the reason for that, there, there, there are two assumptions that have changed with the, the, in the last couple of reports. One, our, our bull case for Tesla in our old model was that it would lose a third of its market share. It, has, it had in 2018, 17 percent global market share, including China. Uh, that it would lose as the t 
Tesla killers came into the market, Audi uh, and uh, Porsche Taycan and, and Jaguar. Well, guess what? Its share increased last year to 18 percent. So you think Tesla can have 17 or 18 percent of the worldwide market when it's all electric vehicles? Is that what you're saying? And if we're right, if we are right, this stock has only begun. But that makes it sound, it makes you think that this isn't actually a vote for Tesla. It's a vote in all these other established car companies completely to failing mm. to make mm. the crucial transition, which they've known for several years they were going to have to make. Yeah, I mean, can and, we really be that pessimistic about the, oh, the likes no, no, of no, BMW? They're or failing other? miserably. Failing miserably. And in battery technology, they're not riding down the consumer electronics cost curve, which Tesla decided to run down, you know, and, and people made fun of them. Oh, you're putting cell phone batteries at, at the bottom of the car, cell phone batteries that blow up? No, they, they chose lithium ion pouch, uh, which is much more costly than uh, Tesla's consumer electronics batteries. So if they want to compete with Tesla, they'll have to sell every electric vehicle at a loss. At the same time, they're losing their internal combustion engine business. The reason this is going to happen is because within the next 18 months, two years, the price of an electric uh, vehicle, like for like categories, is going to drop below that for a gas-powered vehicle for the first time. And it will continue to fall because we're riding down the battery cost curve decline. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the uh, traditional auto manufacturer, if you look at their R&D budgets or you look at GM's, 10% of its R&D, $25 billion in, I'm sorry, uh, capital spending, is uh, allocated to electric. They should be at almost 100 now, given what's about to happen. And I think the reason Berlin, Germany, uh, invited Tesla to build a factory 200 football fields, either soccer or, or, uh, or our football, that big, uh, is because they know they're in trouble. They've got to, they've got to adjust, and or else they're going to lose a tremendous number number of jobs. Don't you think but, it's a little early to count the traditional com companies out of it? I mean, they haven't really almost gotten started. So the that is, how old? is the problem. <laughs> that is the problem. Uh, they have just gotten started, and what they have delivered uh, are cars that don't even meet, uh, whether it's range or other metrics, um, the Model S. Uh, circa 2012. Now, of course. Now, there are three other. There are three other advantages Tesla has. So, batteries one. Uh, second is uh, they have their own artificial intelligence chip, and our analyst James Wang, who uh, who worked at Nvidia, the artificial intelligence company, mm -hmm. for eight years, mm -hmm. looked at the specs of this chip and said, "Oh my gosh, they're f four years ahead of." any other auto manufacturer in terms of the specs out there on chip technology. And that's important because we're going autonomous with electric. And uh, autonomous is an artificial intelligence project, right? right? Uh, the winner will have the most data and the highest quality data. Tesla has 14 billion miles of real-world driving data today. Uh, and the closest competitor, Waymo, has yeah. 20 million. That was a taste of this week's Wall Street Week with Kathy Wood of ARK Investment. The full program airs tonight at 6 p.m. on Bloomberg Television and Radio. That's Eastern Time. It's also available online. But now, let's step back from Tesla, which is doing well, to the markets, which are not doing so well today, as fears of the growing coronavirus have really hit the market. And we return now to Kaylee Lines to explain exactly what's going on. I guess it's the worst day since October. Yeah, I mean, we have now erased the entire gain for 2020 on mm -hmm. the S&P 500. It's like, as the session grows older, the declines just steepen. Right now, we're down by about 1.7%. And it's really just the fears about the coronavirus, the potential economic impact, especially because now we're starting to get the forecast from all the economists on the street on how much really this is going to dent global economic growth. Here at Bloomberg Economics, they say it's going to take China growth down to about four and a half percent. And you had the likes of Jan Hatzius over at Goldman Sachs saying today this could take four tenths off U.S. growth uh, in the first quarter. And he actually said the risk to that is to the downside because of the way this is going to impact sentiment, investment, travel, all of those economic repercussions. And that fear about how this is going to weigh on 
the global economic picture, which already isn't looking totally steady, is really rippling through the market today. And that's without really knowing how bad it gets or how long right. it lasts, because we don't know how long this could last. I mean, SARS, which is not the same thing at all, lasted for quite a few months, actually. Yeah, I mean, and already we have more cases than we had in the yep. SARS epidemic. We're nearing 10,000 now, and there's no end in sight. Obviously, this is spreading quite rapidly. Um, I should note now that a headline is just crossing the Bloomberg about a, health, a yep. spokesperson for New York saying there is no confirmed of the coronavirus yeah. uh, case c confirmed here, which, of course, was reported by the New York Daily yeah, News Yeah, one suspects earlier. it's a response to the New York Daily News. We saw the New York Daily News clarified their report saying right. it hasn't reformed, and now we've got the New York Health Inspection saying no confirmed case. Yeah, but even still, there are still so many cases out there and the likelihood that this will spread is causing concern in the market. And it also goes to your point about sentiment, right? which is we're all ready to believe something like that when it gets reported because everybody is on Tetrix worried about is it going to happen here? What's it going to mean? What's it going to, how's it going to affect my life? Much less, as you say, commerce and growth, economic growth. Right. I mean, the market is literally trading on every new development surrounding this. And I should note too, we got not the greatest growth numbers out of Europe today. That picture already, coronavirus aside, is looking a little weaker. Plus, when you think about un other fundamentals investors would look at, we got a series of disappointing earnings out this morning. The likes of Caterpillar and Honeywell, which we consider economic bellwethers, are saying they don't see a pickup going forward into 2020 because of the broader industrial slowdown. So coronavirus aside, there are still a lot of concerns for investors and traders to really fixate on today. And that's why we're seeing such steep declines. And it's also a potential problem that it's, we're not very well equipped to match. I mean, cutting interest rates is not going to help you with the coronavirus. Right. It doesn't make the virus go away. I mean, there was already discussion of monetary policy reaching its limits right, exactly. and when you have this kind of virus what is a central exactly. banker to do exactly okay thank you so much to Katie Lines for that report on some markets that are struggling I think it's fair to say today coming up on bounce of power we're going to continue on Bloomberg radio in our second hour we'll bring you more highlights from my exclusive conversation with Fed vice chairman Richard Clara Clarida this is balance of power on Bloomberg television and radio coming to you from New York